myself and installed here. Uh, the uh, um, first of all, uh, Cynthia, thank you to the provost and to Helen for this uh, invitation. Uh, being the wrap-up speaker of what's already been an, uh, an extremely rich day uh, is always challenging because people, uh, my predecessors, Raleigh, Mike, and Richard have said some brilliant things, things that I would have liked to have said myself. Uh, and. Uh, Th that formidable challenge is accompanied by uh, an equally formidable uh, rival, which is the lunchtime uh, encroaching upon uh, uh, our uh, audience's uh, intellectual appetites, needing a kind of physical complement. So I will try to add value, hopefully, to this conversation from the perspective of a cultural historian who's also engaged in forms of design practice. I really. Uh, move between those two spaces. And I wanted to start with a really discouraging slide, uh, which I think is symptomatic of a larger conversation. And, and in a sense, it's, it's the conversation that I want to answer in a very strong and polemical way. And I think this entire conference speaks to uh, this, which is a kind of techno-futurist uh, a scenario that's very dominant, has been dominant over the course of the last 20 years with the rise of the World Wide Web as the kind of defining public space of our time, with the tremendous power that digital resources and libraries have created and the expectations that they've created. This is an extinction timeline uh, not, dated 2007, and you notice that libraries are slated to disappear along with desktop computers and post offices around 2020, in other words, within four years. And I think, you know, during the early 2000s, there's a lot of talk like this, a lot of talk about how Google Books uh, was already a larger library, exponentially larger than the library of, the original library of Alexandria. And therefore, that the very notion of a physical place, a uh, knowledge place, uh, it, it seemed, uh, you know, uh, like a quaint uh, vestige of the past. And I'm here really to uh, articulate both from a kind of historical perspective and also a future-oriented perspective why I think that's a, a profoundly naive notion of what knowledge is or, for that matter, what libraries have been, are, or can be for the future. The universal database, first of all, is not a place. Uh, it's an abstraction vis-a-vis -vis social, the social world where knowledge is produced, shared, and reproduced. And that social world has a sensorium that is not reducible to operations of the eye. Uh, uh, it includes touch, taste, smell, and hearing. It includes all of those forms of social interaction. Um, places matter. And places are not generic. Places are not universally transferable, from uh, substitutable one for the other. They are themselves the bearers of history. They summon up those histories. They summon up those histories of community. And I think some of the examples we've seen today are all powerful arguments that respond to, in a sense, this fantasy, which uh, is a fantasy that I don't think we can look at um, simply as an either or proposition. The argument I'm gonna try to make, and I think it's been anticipated already by the prior speakers, is that this is not an either or scenario. It's not Google Books as the universal library or universal database or physical libraries. It's in the intersection between the two that the question of our morning's conference is really rooted, which is the question of the library of the future, which will be a library where that universal database meets uh, physical places, those physical places where knowledge is produced, exchanged, and reproduced. Uh, and I come at this from the perspective of somebody who's, I'm a cultural historian, I was trained as a medievalist. As a matter of fact, I work on high medieval manuscript culture, worked extensively as a historian of the 20th century as well with a focus on architecture and design, and also as somebody who's been involved in areas of experimental practice uh, the lab I run at Harvard is, we, we, we struggle always with defining ourselves. We let, today, as of today, we call ourselves an idea foundry, knowledge design lab, and production studio. We're really interested in modeling new forms of knowledge, of being an experimental space. And I think libraries are that experimental space. And the focus of my remarks today is really going to be this notion of the library 
as a laboratory, uh, as a place, a place uh, yes, of conservation, uh, yes, of uh, dialogue, if you like, communion uh, with the dead, but also a place of production of knowledge, a production of new furniture forms. I, I loved uh, Richard's example because that's exactly the, uh, I, I think it expresses one of the things that libraries have always been. And I come at this from two different perspectives. One is the whole question of what is a digital library. Uh, I think uh, we're still very early in the kinds of transformations of, uh, that digital libraries bring to us and in expressing their true potential to enhance the quality of scholarship, to expand the audiences for advanced forms of knowledge, and to do all kinds of powerful things that they have the capability to do. But that capability, I think, largely still lies in the future. Uh, naturally, as uh, innovation arrives, it, it, it arrives often repeating, looking backwards at forms that we've inherited from the legacy of analog libraries. I, so on the one hand, there's the question of modeling the world of digital libraries and archives. And on the other hand, there's that very real question of designing the 21st century library as a physical space, as a world of furnishings, of policies, of appliances. And uh, as we like to say in the design studio that I run at Harvard, we want to design the 21st century library one component at a time, whether that component is a building or a policy or an appliance or a, a chair, for that matter. Uh, and some of these questions are questions that have come to animate my, my own work. Uh, library Beyond the Book was a book that came out of Library Test Kitchen. I'm going to talk a little bit about Library Test Kitchen. The book itself is an experimental book. The last chapter is the, score, the script for a documentary, which is itself an experimental database documentary. You can see it online at coldstorage.com. And the marginalia in the book are a card deck, which is a generative tool for designers, architects, to think outside the box about what a library could be or should be. Uh, it's an attempt itself to try to reinvent the scholarly book as a book that maybe you might actually want to pick up and not start reading at the beginning, but jump in in the middle uh, to enter on, on different sorts of scales. And it is the expression of a collaborative process called Library Test Kitchen, which is an ongoing design studio at the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, and the metaphor of the test kitchen was important to us because it was an attempt to try to take this very high level conversation, uh, largely among the leadership of uh, the Harvard libraries, uh, staff, specialists, uh, administrative leaders, the leaders of the university, um, to take that conversation um, not away from the experts, on the contrary, but to place that world of expert conversation in direct dialogue with forms of practice, of making, of speculative design. Um, and a design school is an interesting place to do so. It's, it's a world where high-level ideas and forms of practice are engaged in a constant dance. And, uh, and um, the spirit of it was playful from the beginning. This was the poster for the studio. So let's take the reading room of the Boston Public Library, one of the great public libraries in the United States, and think of it as a play space. What kind of forms of play would we like to engage in? What do we, how do we imagine these forms of learning? And the, the questions that the design studio tried to address are th these really fundamental questions of um, what is it what, what does it mean, for example, to design a reading room in an era which is not an era where the digital has supplanted uh, print, but on the contrary, where we have this proliferation of forms of, of channels, so to speak. We have students who arrive with their moleskin notebooks, uh, with uh, all kinds of other paper supports, and who work off of a multitude of different screens, different sizes of screens, different kinds of digital resources. What does that reading room look like? These are the kinds of questions that the design studio addressed. And I'm just going to show you really, really quickly some examples of, of sort of playful student projects. So this is a project um, uh, that was uh, actually uh, developed uh, using RFID tagging, a system where books to, uh, where books uh, search for you once you've searched for them. They remember, books have memories. Uh, once they've been searched for, if they're circulating in a physical space, they'll send you a text message when you walk by the desk where they're stored, for example. Or here is an idea that got a lot of currency in the press, uh, the cold spot. 
now that the world has become a kind of hotspot where we don't go around hunting for um, areas of connectivity, how do we want to program into the architecture of spaces forms of removal, uh, of filtering? Uh, in other words, what's the contemplative space that we want, the contemplative spaces within particularly libraries that we want to construct? These are questions of architecture as well as of access or networks. What do furnishings look like in the library of the 21st century? Uh, while as work disappears into virtual desktops, onto devices, we don't see many forms of production, uh, many forms of curation of information that once were highly visible because of the physical nature of the artifacts involved. How do we create those kinds of environments where the social dimensions of libraries as places where knowledge is exchanged and produced and stored uh, are exposed. Uh, what does a reference desk look like in the 21st century with the kind of hybridity and multiplicity of knowledge sources? How might forms of knowledge gathering become forms of exhibition, of communication? Again, uh, the importance of exposure. And how also might we think about breaking down the boundaries between inside and outside space? Uh, to create a more kind of porous division between the library as a kind of concentrated space of attention and all of these public spaces where knowledge and information is uh, very much in the air, um, so to speak. Uh, and the library was an example, uh, as Helen was kind enough to allude to, of a kind of experiment along those lines. And at Metalab, we do a lot of other work that um, I think uh, essentially uh, follows a similar kind of logic. Uh, we, we're, we've been developing a platform to leverage the power, uh, particularly of public libraries, to use their spaces as a tool of civic, for civic engagement that allows not just people on the inside of libraries, but commu the community actually to treat public libraries as a piece of infrastructure that can be reserved, used, serve as a platform for content creation, for processes of uh, social sharing, uh, uh, community education, lifetime education, and so forth. Last but not least, and I think this is a really important point from the standpoint of the scholarly community, is our libraries are a tremendously powerful data repository. This has been touched upon earlier. Um, and librarians are way ahead of the curve. I think the scholarly community, particularly in the humanities, is behind the curve, but library databases, cataloging databases, the inventories that libraries have elaborated through the course of many, many generations are an incredibly powerful resource if those can be freed up to be used by communities of researchers, researchers who understand the power of data, of shaping data, of telling stories through data, we can do not, not only perform high-level forms of scholarship that are highly meaningful, that are of greater rigor than any of the work that has preceded our, our own generation, but we can also tell stories that engage much broader audiences in some of the kinds of intellectual questions that um, animate fields, in particular historical fields in the humanities. What I'm showing you here, this is just a quick video of an interactive tool that a group of students of mine and I built uh, a few years back that was an experiment with Harvard's open catalog data. We thought, it would, wouldn't it be interesting to take 100 years, the first 100 years of the dissemination of printing, Harvard's collection is just one of maybe 50 or 60 major collections of Incunabula editions and so forth, and take all of those catalogs, aggregate them together, and create an interactive tool that would show us uh, year by year, of publishing event by publishing event, the history of the dissemination of printing. Uh, and it's interesting, as you see, it, that just history of dissemination is a history of acceleration because we start out with very few publishing events and suddenly we see these centers emerging. Now, this is a, uh, an artifact that, of course, falls squarely within the field of the history of the book. Uh, the history of the book is a, uh, has been an extremely rich field in, uh, in the cultural historical uh, scholarly community, um, but typically the stories we can tell as historians are about one place or a cluster of places, Venice, Amsterdam, uh, et cetera. Um, when we have all the data sets of all of the rare book libraries in the world and we put them together, we can tell a kind of global story that no single scholar or single community of scholars can tell. This is the horizon, I think, that is really exciting. And the library is not a support for that process. The library is the lab. It's the place where this work has to happen. So 
I'm going to stop this here. And um, I'm going to sk uh, skip over pretty quickly uh, just a couple of elements in this, uh, in the kind of backstory, if you like, uh, to get to the concluding part of my remarks, which are going to be a kind of library test kitchen recipe for the 21st century library in 10 minutes, OK? So <laughs> whoever's keeping time here, you can just signal me that I'm down to 10 minutes, and I'll skip over the historical backdrop. But I am a cultural historian, actually trained as a literary scholar, so I can't help but play a, a little bit of lip service to etymology. And it is important, I think, uh, also for the architectural history of library spaces to keep in mind that there is something distinctive about libraries. They're one of the most ancient architectural Textual forms known to us. Um, but libraries from the beginning, uh, as the word biblioteca suggests, have a kind of paradox built into them, which is the fact that this is a distinctive architectural form that reflects the nature of what it contains. The biblioteca is a teca. It's a bookshelf, just like a library is a bookshelf in the first instance. Um, but of course, you have to know what a book is in order to design a shelf for a book. There's a circular logic that has shaped the whole history of books and book storage devices, whether the book is a, is a scroll or, um, and Napoleon is a wonder fig wonderful figure to look at this, a great modernizer. Na that's Napoleon's portable library that he carried to battle. That's a biblioteca, that's a library. Um, and he also, of course, built the National Library of France, uh, another kind of container, each of which has a particular set of affordances and a set of temporal assumptions this hybridity of the library as the stuff that's contained and as the container is, is a deep part of its history. And that hybridity applies also to the multimediality of the contents, uh, which go all the way back to the beginnings of libraries. If we look at Strabo's famous description of the Library of Alexandria, um, we'll, note that, we'll notice that for Strabo, and as was true for libraries through much of their history, there really was no distinction between the notion of the book and the notion of any other cultural object or sacred object or ritual object or document that had fundamental importance as recognized by the community that it served. Uh, these distinctions really start kicking in in the late 19th century when we start to separate out different kinds of forms and formats. Um, and that's a story that goes on through many of the, the founding libraries that have shaped the history of libraries, Pergamon, uh, libraries of the Renaissance, these kinds of cabinet of curiosity-like libraries, which were both documents, textual materials, and things, works from the natural world, preserved, and so forth, to the great uh, projects, utopian projects of the 18th century, through to you know, wonderful examples like the Bodleian example that was just uh, evoked in detail in Richard's presentation. And we get through that long process to the, what we typically think of when we say, what is a library today? And that answer is very closely connected to the rise of storage systems at the end of the 19th century uh, that were, became a necessity, particularly because of the explosion in printed documents that happened thanks to the industrialization of printing in the 19th century. Um, and uh, that centrality of storage systems, then supported by reading rooms and by reference desks and by other appendages, that kind of normative image of the library is really the product of a very particular situation uh, that uh, is, culminates at the end of the 19th century and continues into the 20th century. New York Public Library, which is a kind of embodiment of that, um, is a fascinating case in point. It was built at the early in the early 20th century. I don't know if this is true of the uh, Western Library at uh, Oxford, but the real spectacle that, uh, that totally captivated, believe it or not, audiences at the time of its construction was the shelving system. This amazing uh, Sneed stack system, which uh, this is, you see the side section of the Library of Congress version, the uh, same system, same exact system. Uh, this was the first full industrial strength shelving system. And these shelving systems were not built just to hold books. They hold up the roof of the edifice. Uh, so if you're looking for a metaphor uh, 
of a certain iteration of what a library is, this is a splendid one, because what it suggests to you is that there was a kind of excitement about just the massive scale of the storage operations that became part of this normative idea of the library. And it was something that New York Public featured. They used to take people on walks when they first opened. Uh, it was thought of as like a kind of fantastic journey to be able to go visit the stacks of, uh, of New York Public. And it's the legacies of this are, are everywhere, so I'm not going to linger over them. I'm just going to sort of click, click forward here, as promised, to conclude uh, with a little bit of thinking about the library of tomorrow. How does that modernist library that emerged at the end of the 19th century, that got codified in the course of the 20th century, move into our, our own uh, expanded situation where digital resources, digital assets, digital methodologies, digital tools are now reaching us side by side, not just with the past, but with new and emerging practices around print, around writing, around uh, analog forms of writing. Um, and I think the answer to the, that question of what the library of tomorrow is, is in some sense, a hybrid multimedia space of knowledge, access, and activation, and production. And this is a continuation of, of that long history. But of course, that answer doesn't answer the question of what kind of space for knowledge access, what it actually looks like, what are its furnishings. Um, architects have been experimenting with answers to this question in a multitude of contexts. You'll notice up here the Seattle Public, which is the Office of Metropolitan Architecture's 2004 uh, Public Library for Seattle. We have uh, NC State's Hunt Library by uh, Snow Hedda, a very rich and interesting proposition for uh, we have uh, David Ajay's work on the idea stores, but we're really just at the beginning of this adventure, and it's an adventure where physical structures are flanked, of course, by the rise of digital libraries, uh, that which themselves are undergoing redesign uh, as we speak. And it's the combination of these two that I think really interests me um, in particular here. So I want to come back to my, my recipe book here. Uh, to start answering these questions uh, just in a very kind of sketchy way, and I'm going to jump forward here uh, j just with a note to say that this is a very old question. Throughout the 20th century, there's been a debate about how the library as a place of preservation becomes a place of production. Uh, the laboratory as library, the library as laboratory, is an idea that goes back, runs throughout the 1930s, to the 1950s, and every media revolution that comes along, whether it's video, whether it's, uh, uh, it's uh, you know, photography, telephony, there's a piece of that that reflects the debate about the future of libraries. OK, so let's come to our, we go back to the library test kitchen uh, and to the library and just t talk our way through. So, the 10-minute recipe, uh, what are the components, at least the beginnings, the, uh, the rudiments of what might make up um, that space? And I want to say, first of all, the one thing it's not going to be is a sublime storage structure. <laughs> I think we've seen many of the ways in which that narrative about libraries is one that's increasingly being replaced by freeing up that stack space to do more exciting, more value-added kinds of things. The second thing it's not going to be, I think, and this is something we need to think about as designers, is that if this is a reading room, or the reading room of the 21st century, it looks an awful lot like a 19th century tobacco factory. It's not a very rich assertion of how we weave together information and space. And if there's anywhere in our landscape where information and space need to be woven together productively, it's in the context of libraries. So let's start with storage. Obviously, storage. Um, is a fundamental function, but storage has been moving off-site for ha at least a century. And documents are, of course, migrating to digital forms, but they're also leading multi-channel lives. They're not reducible to a single form. And books, of course, are not going away. Print culture has been expanding, not rather than contracting, during the, the digital revolution. So the real challenges we face have to do with the nature of this hybrid environment. Um, so for me, the question of adding values is a design question. It's the, the question is, what are the strategic spaces that we can leverage, to f we can re what are the reutilization re scenarios for traditional space devoted to storage that ought to be central to every project of redesign or new design? A second point, which I think is related 
is whereas ordinary collections, of course, are precisely the collections that have, tip, are, have increasingly migrated into digital forms and di digital environments, our special collections retain their singularity. They often are the most expressive materials of that place bound nature of the library. So I think one of the challenges, but one of the uh, defining features of many contemporary li library projects, and I'm, I think we're going to see this more and more, is the significance and centrality that they attribute to those special collections. Special collections need to be placed at the center, not at the periphery. And levels of access and experience of them are fundamental to the nature of the kind of place that we want libraries to be in the 21st century. A third point is implicit in pretty much everything everybody has said today, which is the importance of connections, of not just focusing on collections as, uh, or collecting as the central defining mission of what a library is. Library mobilizes, leverages those co collections to do things, to activate them. Fourth, reference. The reference desk as we knew it is dead. We need other models for how we perform acts of reference. The need for filtering for reference is as great, if not greater, than it was a century ago. But the notion of clients who go to a desk to, as if to buy a ticket is not one that reflects the styles, the means in which today's readers uh, seek uh, reference, expert information, expert feedback. A fifth point, which is very important to me, which is going a little bit back more in the direction of that kind of ancient concept of the library, not as a place of where books are segregated from handwritten records, are segregated from objects, are segregated from other kinds of materials, but rather thinking about rebuilding those families of collections, uh, uh, thinking of the library increasingly as a, an institution that has a porous relationship to the museum, for example, where those exhibition functions that were always part of libraries become featured uh, in a greater, to a greater degree and where uh, distinctions between object categories are less a kind of defining feature of the operating system of libraries. Um, books are only one expression of how knowledge is produced and formed. Tools are also integral to uh, the larger social functions that libraries play. Why not expand the library to encompass the kinds of tools that are the defining tools by which meanings are created in our own time? Cold spots. I mentioned this notion of cold spots. I think it's a very rich one. The notion of the library as a contemplative space is deep in its DNA, and it's not, of course, the only definition of, uh, of its role. I think noisy environments have to be programmed alongside quiet environments. But our architectures typically haven't really grappled with the rich set of possibilities for mixing the quiet, uh, the retreat, and the, the, the main square. Uh, we have to think, I think, uh, more creatively, more innovatively about the opportunities there. Collaboration. Uh, almost every contemporary library design has understood the importance for creating new kinds of collaboration spaces. Solitary reflection is one way of engaging with knowledge forms. There are also deeply social ways, and those have to be facilitated just as much as the traditional contemplative model. The very notion of uh, study uh, increasingly, I think um, digital media, I think, have, have contributed to this, is, uh, has broken down the boundary between the idea of, of separation between hand and mind. Maker spaces, other kinds of environments where fabrication or where the translation, if you like, of reflective processes into forms of physical making or production, uh, whether it involves digital media, a video, et cetera, uh, that kind of fluid sense of, uh, of how knowledge is produced, circulate, circulates, uh, is distributed, is important to embed in the, in the sort of physical structure of our, uh, our, of our libraries. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of talk in contemporary society about smart cities, about uh, smart spaces, and so forth. But most of our spaces are not terribly smart. Even smart spaces turn out to be kind of strangely rudimentary in all kinds of ways. And libraries have the, an opportunity, I think, to model what a smart space could, could be and should be. Um, and I think this question of uh, 
having spaces that are spaces that communicate work in progress, and particularly the processes by which knowledge is c collected, curated, aggregated, shared. Um, thinking about this, the, this kind of function of not exhibition as finished programming, but rather exhibition as integral to the social dimensions of the way knowledge is produced, is something uh, uh, is a domain where libraries have a special opportunity and a special uh, responsibility. Uh, this is my favorite pet project. I've managed to convince people to try it out at Harvard. Uh, it's been pretty successful, I think. The idea that stack structures, legacy storage units, can be programmed. In other words, we, one of the things that databases allow us to do is to not simply repeat the universal classification schemes of the past. So what if we take entire book collections and we recurate them constantly? We reorganize them on the fly. We take the stack as an exhibition space where we allow, for example, somebody who's teaching a course, actually Richard uh, alluded to this, uh, in relation to the volcanoes, right? We take a section of a collection that maybe very few people visit <laughs> over the course of its multi-century life, and we feature and organize it the way we would organize an exhibition gallery in an art museum. Uh, and we do this as part of the ordinary, everyday cycles, life cycles of, uh, of a library. I think it's a very powerful tool for activating uh, knowledge resources that otherwise have a tendency to go off and sit in storage. To treat the stack, in other words, as a kind of programming space, not as a space that uh, is simply there, uh, assigned its place in a universal knowledge scheme. And my model for this, some of you may recognize this photograph. It's a photograph of Abi Vorburg's, uh, his library at the University of Hamburg. And Vorburg had this, uh, this is from the uh, 1930s, and Vorburg thought of his library as a working library. In other words, he was constantly reorganizing the books and reorganizing pictures in relation to these books as if it was uh, a kind of work in pro a perpetual work in progress, uh, a pre-expression of a book that he would eventually write. Uh, he, re he never really wrote, fully wrote that book. But in it, what we have as a legacy are these photographs, these location photographs. I think there's something very powerful in that notion that I think is also an exciting way to animate those kinds of analog resources uh, in dialogue with digital resources. Um, that's an opportunity. And that brings me to my last point, which is the importance of process. Print culture is tremendously powerful, and it will remain, I think, a part of the landscape. It tends to bias our thinking, our way of imagining scholarship, forms of knowledge, towards a final product, towards something that once it is defined, once it has reached its final form, uh, it abides in that form. And digitally based models of publication are, are of course different in the sense that they are profoundly iterative. They change on the fly. We can have a constant editioning of something throughout the life of a research pro project. And our institutions I think need to increasingly mirror that process-based orientation to get us away from just a focus on aggregating products towards a focus on facilitating and supporting uh, processes. Thank you very much. Okay.